this is this is um, our our kind of working vision uh, over the past four or five years. Um, this idea of the conservation blueprint um, coming out of a, a collaboration, and this the idea was that um, there are a lot of of conservation stakeholders in New Jersey. And sometimes we don't know what each other's doing. And they're on different levels. They're at the state level, local levels, county levels, regional levels. People are doing great work. And then one thing that is really humbling as a academic that looks at land use and looks at land policy and so forth um, is the amount of, of conservation activity that has happened in New Jersey over the last 30 years. Now that's in the face of a lot of development pressure, um, but I think that the story uh, is that's emerging is that there has been a tremendous um, uh, grassroots effort to uh, have responsible conservation uh, while New Jersey still has lands to conserve. So, you know, so one of the things that's really remarkable in, this, in, in you know, the, from my perspective is, is the realization of how much lands have been conserved in New Jersey. Um, Really, uh, and, and New Jersey starting as a proprietary state with absolutely zero public land, you know, compared that to the Western states that start out as public land, uh, it's a lot easier to conserve when you have so, um, so much of the land that is publicly owned. New Jersey, every acre of public open space has been, um, has been acquired um, by, by, um, by process. And so that's really remarkable uh, that we have, uh, you know, um, uh, so much land that that is uh, in conservation. Now there are still uh, a a fair amount of land left, and that land will be developed at some point or another, um, depending on economics. It may be within 50 years. It may be within 150 years. Um, but the idea is that some of that land is really. Um, very, very important, and some of it is maybe lower on the tier of importance to create an interconnected network of functional open space. And so that's a, that's a kind of a, a big idea, but how do we find those lands that are the key ones for creating uh, the network uh, of open spaces that would be ideal if we can do that? And that's part of the vision of the conservation blueprint, is identifying the most important lands uh, remaining as the process of of conservation and land development uh, continues in the race for open space. Now, let's again put this in perspective of our state. We are the most densely populated state in in uh, in the nation. We have almost nine million people and about five million acres. Um, that makes us have a population density of about twelve hundred people per square mile. And that's a population density that's higher than. Japan are even higher than India. It's kind of hard to wrap your head around that. Now, not that India doesn't have mega cities with high with, with high population in the cities themselves, but it's land wise. If you take all the land, uh, and the the density of population in New Jersey is 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 certainly um, the most significant. Um, and what that what that means is that there is uh, a competition for land and for land use uh, here. And, and part of that is the, the fact that we are adjacent to the largest and the fifth largest metropolitan area in the country, in North America, really, with New York City. Ben Franklin used to call New Jersey a barrel tapped at two ends. And our largest cities are in other states, which is quite, you know, quite remarkable. Um, but we certainly have the greater New York area um, economically and culturally dominating northern New Jersey and the, um, the, the metropolitan Philadelphia area um, having a major impact in southern New Jersey. So this is our this is our land use. This is the geography of New Jersey. We can see the development patterns and we can also see some of the, the resources that are make New Jersey's environment be quite uh, quite remarkable. Um, we have this million acre pine forest in southern New Jersey that's relatively undeveloped. You can see the the red areas there, uh, Hamilton pops out, but um, you you know it's it's remarkably undeveloped uh, considering how close it is to Philadelphia. And then we have the New Jersey Highlands in northern New Jersey, which is where we are talking about for today's today's uh, conference. 
And, um, and it's a very unique area ecologically. And it's also remarkably, um, uh, um, it, it has a remarkable level of conservation activity considering its proximity to New York. Um, and so, you know, that's uh, areas that the state has identified as being special areas of, of, um, uh, of protection. We also can see something that is um, quite remarkable for New Jersey. It's also is related to its vulnerability. And I think Dave Robinson will, will be talking about uh, climate change in New Jersey, but you know, one of the, the main concerns for climate change is going to be sea level rise. Look at New Jersey, you know, all the way up to Trenton on the, on the western side is tidal Delaware River. And the entire east coast is oceanfront. And all that light green, all that light blue, which is the wetlands, are all, are all marsh areas that will be very much in play with sea level change. Uh, so, you know, we are a state that really is, um, it, it's important for us in very profound ways to be thinking about land use and to be understanding that conservation isn't about just creating nice parks for us to, to play in. It is really about preserving the integrity of the ecosystem to the degree, that, to the degree that's possible with the amount of potential change that is, lies ahead in the coming decades and in the coming centuries. So I think this conservation activity that we are all thinking about today uh, is something that is, has, has profound implications for the future uh, as, as New Jersey's landscape will be changing as climate changes. Now, the agricultural areas of New Jersey are in yellow, uh, and you can see they're kind of on the western side of New Jersey, certainly in Salem County and Hunterdon and Warren counties up in the north. Um, we still have a significant intact agricultural industry in New Jersey. And we're going to see how farmland preservation is also part of this uh, toolkit of, of conserving New Jersey's landscape integrity. New Jersey has about a million acres of wetlands. You see that in blue. Uh, and um, wetlands has a good measure of protection in New Jersey, although we are still losing wetlands. Uh, it doesn't mean that they are preserved. It means that they are regulated. And so um, we have uh, about a third of New Jersey now has been developed. And, it, you know, my most recent land use development report that was released this past summer in collaboration with Rick Lathrop at the um, at Rutgers Remote Sensing Center, uh, we really looked at land use change up to 2015 and development trends shifted towards redevelopment of urban areas and it slowed down in the rural areas, the amount of development pressure. I think with COVID, that has completely been a game changer. Uh, and we have no idea what the pressures on rural areas will be as people potentially are concerned about living in close urban areas. So stay tuned <laughs> to land use change in, in, in the future of New Jersey as a state. We'll talk about it uh, for Northwest New Jersey as we get through more of the presentation here. So, uh, you know, this is, this is the big picture here. Often, you know, if we can see things from a bigger perspective, um, we can perhaps see solutions um, that we didn't see before. And so we, we were thinking about this from this 30,000 foot perspective, how New Jersey's landscapes uh, have been changing uh, over the last few decades. And the change is dramatic. Um, we, in a matter of three decades, have urbanized over 360,000 acres. That's more than a third of a million acres in only, uh, in only 30 years. And so we look at this change over time and we see you know, if, we, if we map the land that was developed by 1986, it's about 1.2 million acres. And then we track that development over time. We can see that as the red measles begin to grow on the map, uh, we see how that development of open spaces, farmlands, forest lands, and even wetlands have been developed over time. So let me just go back here and you can see those bars changing, right? So 1986, and then we go to 1995, you can watch agriculture dropping significantly, forest dropping, uh, even wetlands dropping, because the urban growth, the, you know, they're, they're not as, uh, 
Uh, Will Rogers said, they're not, you know, buy land, they're not making any more of it. Uh, so, you know, when you, when you have urbanization that comes at the expense of other land uses. We get up to 2012, which is this slide is, is doesn't incorporate 2015 data that we produced this, this summer. Um, we will be updating that. But we can see here when we when we if we were to uh, take and sweep together all those little red blobs that are New Jersey's development growth, um, it would be 360,000 acres by 2015. Uh, so that's in 29 years, uh, three three hundred and sixty thousand acres of, of land that converted from open spaces to developed lands. Here is a, a pie chart of that, and you can really see that that shift. Uh, we have the growth in in developed land going from 25 percent. So we went from a quarter developed to a third developed between in that in that 29 year period. But the you know, one of the big success stories is look at the amount of preserved land that has um, that has that has changed over time, uh, going from a third preserved to um, you know fifty almost fifty three percent preserved in in the course of twenty nine years. That's the that's the the success story that really hasn't been told, and that I think that many people on this call are involved with conservation activities uh, can maybe get an appreciation of how. This collaborative effort, it's, it's, like, it's almost like crowdsourcing of conservation efforts throughout the state um, has resulted, I think, in something that um, is much better than it could have been, but not where it's going to be yet, right? There's still a lot of work to be done to identify those most important lands for conservation. And so that's really the genesis of the conservation blueprint. That's the big vision is we have a lot of different groups that are working on these on, on conservation, but how do you get them to be on the same page? How do we, how can we, we be working from the same set of, of information so that maybe more than one group isn't trying to, to um, work on a project that you don't know the other person is working on or that you're just assuming that another piece of land that's not in your region of interest is being protected by somebody else and maybe it's slipping through the cracks. So having a, um, Having a a uh, a common uh, a common vision, uh, of, of a, based in a map, uh, can be a way in which we can work on the same vision for a a functional open space network in the future. Um, and so um, I see uh, one of the questions here about the breakdown between preserved and constrained lands. I'm going to show you that in when I get to the demo. So maybe bring that question back up because we do have mapping that, that breaks that down between preserved and constrained lands. Um, and um, uh, and that's, I think, a really key question. You know, how much of the land that we have preserved is already somewhat protected, say, by wetlands um, types of regulations and so forth. So I'll, I'll circle back around from, for, for that. Um, Conservation Blueprint is uh, the leadership team is Nature Conservancy, Rowan University, and the Jersey Conservation Foundation. Um, but we, although we call it, we're, we're set, we have this label of leadership team, it doesn't mean that we are leading this process. <laughs> it's actually being led by a steering committee of over two dozen organizations. And these are organizations at, at all different levels. We have state representation from Green Acres, from Farmland Preservation, SADC. Uh, we have um, nonprofits, we have local organizations, and we have you know, in, in some cases, uh, individual um, uh, citizens that are participating in this process. So the conservation blueprint is is a um, it, it is a set of maps that live on the platform of New Jersey Map, which we host out of Rowan. But the conservation blueprint is really a process and a collaborative um, experiment with a lot of stakeholders. So when we say conservation blueprint, we mean also in, in, in addition to the mapping, which I'll be demonstrating, the, it, the, the people that are coming together to, uh, to, to not only use this map, to, but to continue to, to shape the map and to have their interests put into the map. The, the mapping that I'll be showing is, has evolved tremendously over the last five years. Um, and it's mostly through input from from people that have been involved in this process. So um, as I as I mentioned, I see a number of people in the list who are attending that have been part of the conservation blueprint process. 
and I see a lot of new names and faces, and I welcome you to <laughs> to join in uh, in this process by using the map and getting involved in uh, in in the activities and the steering committee meetings that we have. Um, okay, so what are the the real um, driving visions for the, the conservation blueprint? Uh, we want to be able to uh, to accelerate the protection of the most important areas remaining to protect. Uh, and so we want to be able to create information that um, that really supports planning because conservation isn't just about preserving land and walking away. Uh, there's there's a certainly a dimension of stewardship after it has been preserved, but there's also a dimension of the other end of the spectrum. How do we create great development patterns that are integrated and coordinated and um, that uh, take advantage of having great networks of open space, right? So planning isn't just about pre preservation, it's about creating great communities, which also includes great development, smart development, uh, compact development. How do we create this tool in a way that is uh, providing the information that's needed but that is usable to non-GIS experts. That's a huge part of what, we're, what we've been trying to develop is to make this accessible to, to, um, to all potential users by having kind of different levels of sophistication. Uh, you can kind of um, go in and, and just have the maps prepackaged for you, or you can get in under the hood and get more data out of it. That's kind of the vision of, of what we're trying to do. Um, <clears throat> and what we hope that we're working towards and what I think is emerging is this living map of priority lands um, that will be the focus of collaborative crowdsourced conservation activities in, in the coming decade. Uh, and, you know, uh, it's again, it's not just about preserved open space. It's about a functional ecosystem and a functional urban ecosystem an urban uh, community. How do we live? And when I say urban, I mean all developed lands, it's suburban, rural um, uh, settlements and so forth. That's all human habitat. How do we make our human habitat and our wildlife habitat and our natural ecosystem be the most functional system we can have in a state that's home rule, where most decisions are made by local town planning boards? that are not experts. They may hire their, uh, their engineers and their consultants, but in the end, it comes down to empowering people with information that will help them to understand their environment better and to create visions of a, of, um, of a development future and a conservation future that uh, does the best that we can to provide that, um, that, that those activities happen in the most responsible way and that we have you know the future generations in our mind for the activities that happen right now so here is just a a, a splash page that has some of the the steering committee members i mentioned there's at least two dozen that have been involved um and um and you know it's been really um uh, a, a remarkable process in that many of these stakeholders have been coming back four times a year over the last five years. Uh, maybe it's because of the free lunches, but I think there's something more <laughs> that has been going on that has kept many of the steering committee members engaged and involved. Uh, and there are there is room for more organizations to get involved with the blueprint process. And so um, and it's been difficult with COVID. We have not had any meetings since last March that are uh, that are steering committee wide. Um, and I, I think we will be working on something for the winter time to try to gather the steering committee again. Uh, so stay tuned for that if you have been on the Blueprint Steering Committee. And if you're interested in getting involved, um, uh, stay tuned for opportunities for this. So, um, you know, we, we are still continuing to move forward and um, the steering committee will be, you know, definitely, it's, it's really been key to this project being, I think, as meaningful as it has been. Because, you know, we at Rowan, we're, we're into mapping, but we don't know the whole conservation process like the stakeholders on the ground. Uh, and so, you know, we don't know what to map until we're told. And um, and I think it's been a very, very rich uh, experience in developing this. 
So this is the end of, of Eric's uh, PowerPoint. <laughs> I hope that, that um, I did justice to, to Eric uh, and, um, and uh, you know, kind of give, he is such a, a, a powerful speaker himself. Uh, and so I was trying to channel him here. Uh, but, um, you know, it's really been, as I say, quite a, a, a rewarding experience to work with Eric and the, and the Nature Conservancy and the Conservation Foundation um, as the, the as the kind of the instigators of pulling this all together. But again, it's the steering committee and all of the users um, that have been really making this be something that I think has a life of its own. So that's the blueprint overview. Uh, and maybe um, I can um, open up for uh, any any comments or questions about this. I'll stop sharing my screen for a second here um, and um, see if there are any um, any points that, um, that or questions that people have. Um, I, I am going to have another PowerPoint after this that will be getting into the Highlands uh, watershed cluster a study that we did about build out. Um, and so I'll demonstrate that. And then after that PowerPoint where I've discussed that, that study, then I'll open it up and we can have live demo and we can have a, um, you know, uh, we can have questions or, you know, examples of people want to look at a particular parcel or something like that. So um, that, that's kind of my, my, my plan to open it up for actually exploring the conservation blueprint is to have the last third of the session be really open to, um, to seeing what people, what, what people want. Uh, so um, I see a couple chats coming in here. Um, please ask questions. Okay, okay. Has a blueprint been shared with the State Planning Commission? If so, what is the interaction? Um, the, the, the state, there are people on the State Planning Commission that are aware of Blueprint. I don't know if it's been formally presented to them, um, but we certainly are looking for partnerships in the State Planning Commission um, um, with that. So that's a good question. And um, I see Ryan Carter is responding there. Um, okay, and then Michelle is saying, could we see slides that we missed so that we can do quick screenshots? Well, I can make the PowerPoints um, available. I think that the um, the video recording of this session will also be available. Uh, and so let me get through the coming PowerPoint and through opening up to demo. And then at the end, perhaps we can go back to slides that were missed. Okay. So, um, so I hope you got a, an appreciation of the vision of the conservation blueprint. Um, let me look at my direct messages here. Yeah, so um, so we did address we, the, the question about state planning. Uh, the, so the blueprint um, started about about five years ago now when we first had the kind of the, the discussion over lunch at the land trust rally <laughs> of what we could do uh, to uh, to create something that helped people work together in conservation. Uh, and here we are with uh, with it in a, I think a pretty functional format, um, but it continues to be developed and it will continue to grow in the coming months and years, hopefully. Um, it is. It has been funded by a number of different sources um, and that's, you know, we're trying, we, we're, it's imperative to us to keep this as free and open access. Uh, and so that requires then having um, operational support and um, Rowan has been supported by the Dodge Foundation uh, which helps to carry a part of this project. But then we've also had funding from William Penn Foundation. The Nature Conservancy itself has found some money to put into uh, the blueprint, as well as the New Jersey Conservation Foundation, um, and through some grants that, that they have helped to channel money to support this as well. Okay, so um, so with that, let me, um, let me uh, launch into my next, um, part of the presentation, and this is focusing specifically on Northwest New Jersey rivers and the potential build out for this region. Uh, and what I'm showing is the is a um, study that is available on New Jersey map. New Jersey map is a collection of a number of different mapping projects and, and the blueprint is one of our biggest, but what you're gonna see is a place where we have this study 
also on New Jersey map, although it's not technically in the blueprint section of New Jersey map, they work together and I'll show that. But this is a study that, um, that is looking at the, the, the development patterns within the New Jersey Highlands cluster, what has been de developed in the past and what the potential is for future development, what, how much could still change under current zoning. So let me, let me bring that up here and see if I can replicate what I did before. Um, Okay, hopefully you can see my PowerPoint screen now. Um, although I don't think this is right. This is not in presentation mode. Okay. Okay, I think you can see it now. Um, okay. There we go. Okay, couldn't figure out how to change slides there with multiple screens. <laughs> All right, so the Delaware River um, Watershed Initiative, the Highlands Cluster, probably familiar to most people uh, on this session. It's probably why you're at the conference today. But here's a map just reminding us where we're talking about. And so it's a number of watersheds. We see uh, it, it touches um, areas that are largely in Warren County and Sussex County, and then uh, kind of on the edge of Mars County and Hunterdon County. You can see the 80 or so um, municipalities that are in that region on the map on the right. Um, and here are the watersheds themselves that we are talking about. So the major watersheds are certainly Musconetcong, the Pequest, the Pollenskill as far as size goes, but the Lopatcong, Pohatcong, and uh, Pohatancing Brook um, Stony Brook, the, those are all important watersheds in that there are significant settlements in those areas, um, uh, particularly in the Lopatcong and the Pohatcong Creeks, although they're smaller in size. Uh, we can see on the right the, uh, the settlements that are significant within the region. Uh, the, the, the developed land or the urban land is in pink, and so we can see the, the, the Phillipsburg, Greater Phillipsburg area, Belvedere, Washington, uh, Hackettstown, Newton, Blairstown, these are kind of centers of, of uh, development, of settlement in, in this region. Um, and so the question is, how has the, the, this region changed over the recent decades? I mean, we all can drive around any place in New Jersey and see how things have changed over time. Something that used to be a farm field might now be a Walmart. And we know that land is changing. Uh, but it happens at a slower pace as far as the timing that humans are really accustomed to, you know. But in, as far as the ecosystem and the geology, geologic change, that happens in a much slower time period. So how can we get an appreciation for those changes that have been happening, say, over decades? And, and fortunately, New Jersey, since the mid-1980s, have been developing really highly detailed, excellent land use mapping. Uh, it came out of actually the process of the state plan. Uh, and uh, so in 1986, we had our first statewide mapping done through aerial photography that was um, meticulously traced. And, um, and uh, so uh, in 1986, this region of New Jersey had about 51,000 acres of, of development. In it, you can see it in those pink areas. You know, certainly Phillipsburg and um, uh, and Hackettstown stand out. Uh, you can you can kind of identify them there. 
If we fast forward to the most recent land use data that was released about a year ago to this month, then this DEP released their 2015 data. It takes, by the way, like three to four years for the pictures to turn into maps because it is a, a complicated process. But we can see the growth that happened in that time period, 29 years. Uh, the red the red areas are areas that you had land development, urban growth. Um, and we can see that it is speckled throughout the region, but there are certainly clusters in and around areas that had already had significant settlements, certainly in the greater Phillipsburg area and Hackettstown um, uh, as well. How much land can, developed in that time period? 26,000 acres, almost 27,000 acres, okay? So that's a significant increase. That's like a 50% uh, increase in, in, in developed land over 30 years. Uh, and so what is the impact of that development? And, you know, we can look at things such as the growth in population. Now that it has impacts that are, are um, uh, many different levels that we can think about, not only just impacts to land and environment, but also fiscal impacts, um, schools and services and so forth. Um, we can look at the, the urban growth. We can look at the number of building units built. We can look at how much farmland was lost, how much forest land lost, how much wetlands lost, and probably the most significant single environmental indicator is inferior surface increase. So these were things that we identified that we could measure these changes over time by looking at the, the GIS land use data and other uh, supporting data layers. And so that's what we did for the study here. Uh, and you know, we, we started with the, with the kind of backdrop of, well, okay, we know the land that was developed, how much land has already been preserved in this region? Uh, and it's pretty significant. We calculated the, the areas of, uh, of open space, green acres, um, and that, that's mapped here in, in green, about 88,000 acres already preserved. We also mapped all the farmland preservation uh, with conservation easements on it. You can see that mapped in the orangish color. And so, yeah, a significant amount of land already in farmland preservation. We also know that there are about 41,000 acres of wetlands that have a measure of regulatory protection. There are also planning systems in place. And so we see here the overlay of the Highlands Regional Master Plan, which is the southern part of the cluster is, uh, is overlaid by that. And then the area that is in the north Western part of the cluster uh, is under the jurisdiction of the state plan. And so we have the different state planning areas that you can see in the map here. So there is a measure of regional planning that we that are in place here that make a, a significant difference on, um, on the way development patterns are gonna happen uh, in, in the future. So we take them into consideration. What's the planning? What is the zoning? What is already preserved? And um, we're able to use those information uh, in developing uh, our model to answer some of these questions. Okay, so I'm not gonna go through these, but you know, these are some of the driving factors for this study. One thing that we, we knew that was important for this analysis to be meaningful is for it to happen on a parcel level. Parcels are the level at which development occurs. They are at the level at which conservation occurs. And so could we project the build-out potential of each individual parcel in the land that is remaining and get an idea of what could be lost if, if land is developed according to zoning? So it incorporates zoning and incorporates um, lands that would be potentially regulated, such as wetlands, incorporates the already existing preserved open space and farmland preservation. Uh, and it's really, we had to break it down into two different approaches to modeling this build out because residential build out is a kind of a different process than commercial and industrial. So residential, we took a housing unit approach. We figured how many housing units could a par parcel absorb? And then what would it look like if you built that number of housing units? Whereas commercial industrial, we said how much land would be covered in the coverage basis? Because zoning is, is often a maximum coverage for commercial and industrial land. So you'll see, uh, I'll give you a quick, a quick peek at the methods of how we got this information, right? So here are the constraints. 
So, you know, just, you know, quickly looking at this here, we have um, steep slopes in red. We have green acres in green. We have farmland preservation in brown. We have wetlands and buffers in shades of, of blue. These are all areas and, and then land that's already developed. You can see in pink and in building footprints there, all right? So what do we take everything that's already been developed, already been preserved or is restricted and we say, that's off the table. That's probably not gonna get future development. Then what are you left with are those white donut holes. That's where development could go because it, there's not constraints to it there. So focus on those white uh, donut holes as we then map them out and we call that a remaining available lands. Lands that are not protected, not constrained by regulations, not already developed uh, and not preserved. And so there it is. There is the, the remaining lands that we identified through this modeling throughout the, uh, the, the watershed cluster. And we can see it's a total of 81,500 acres of land left. Well, that's, you know, that's a significant amount, um, but it's also humbling about how little is actually left, meaning that land has been developed or preserved or regulated uh, throughout this area. So we're focusing on those purple areas, remaining lands, because that's where the development can occur. And so for our model, we only allow our model to build houses and to build industrial commercial in those purple areas. So what we do is, you know, we are, um, we are, this is trying to get into the weeds of the, of the modeling itself here. I think I'll just show you graphically. Um, I'll blow through the, some of these sides, but we take our parcels and we remove parcels that have been developed already. You can see them in the land use map here as pink. So all parcels that are already developed, they're off the table. They're not on the table to be developed in future development. They could be redeveloped, but that's a different process than what we're thinking about here. We're looking at landscape changes of land that's not developed. That's what we're concerned with in this build out calculation. So we take land areas already developed, we remove them, and then we, we create a grid that's based on zoning so that we could space our new units that out in a, mount, in a way that replicates how much land any new unit would, would take depending on the zoning. So you can see the zoning here, the, the top left is R1.5, that means acre and a half is a minimum lot size. R2 would be uh, two acres minimum lot size. And each of our squares represents a lot that would be potentially using up that much land. So we create our grid and we say, this is how many units that land could absorb. We remove the areas that are, we only select the areas that are in the areas that are the donut holes, remaining open space, right? The purple areas. And we remove everything else and we say, those are the places where new houses could occur. And then we have our, our uh, new house location point map. Now it's a little bit robotic looking because it's on a grid. So we mix it up a little bit. We put a little bit of a, of a wiggle factor in there uh, and we, make it look a little bit more uh, natural just for visual representation. Then we say any house is going to have a footprint. It's not just a point on a map. And so we create a, an impact footprint. So if it's a forest area, that's area that will be cleared. If it's an agricultural area, that's the area that becomes a, a, a lawn. Um, and, and so we, we estimated by looking at past land use how big that footprint is. We created buffers around our points to represent that footprint. And voila, we have our land area consumed by the housing that could be built. We model putting in driveways uh, because there's driveway infrastructure and road infrastructure. Um, and then uh, we have our build out model that way. Commercial is a little bit different. We take our commercial land and, and identify it. And we also remove um, areas that are already developed. We remove the constraints. And so we're left with that purple map again. Where do you have undeveloped, unprotected, unconstrained lands, and it's purple. So that purple is the land area that could be developed in our industrial commercial locations. And we say, all right, the regulation says you can do 60% imp uh, impervious cover on a particular lot. And we look at that purple land and we say, okay, how much of that would be 60% of that lot? And so we do a buffer that shrinks that purple down. And we say this orange footprint is where you could build commercial industrial. Now, it might not look exactly like this, but the amount of land consumed per lot is going to be pretty much right on. And so each of these lots could develop commercial industrial to that orange footprint uh, because that's what the regulation says they could have the maximum coverage of that lot. So there we go. There's our industrial commercial footprint by parcel. 
and we put driveway infrastructure in for that as well. And we add our residential and there's our new land use map. We have a land use map that projects what the future could be if everything was developed to according to what the zoning says. If it says it's commercial industrial, okay, let's build all that out. If it's residential, let's build all that out. And we create this, this land use map that we can then estimate what will be the future amount of, of, of development, of acres consumed, of then what is lost in forest and in agriculture and wetlands, and, um, and how many units. And so we can do these projections uh, and we can have our build out be broken down and, and we can do it by different geographies. So we can say, okay, any particular township, how many units would you get in this build out scenario? Or we can do it by watershed or sub watershed. Uh, how many units will the pollen skill get if it's built everything out to, uh, to what is um, directed by zoning? So anyway, this is, the, this is what, we, what we get here. What I wanna do now <laughs> is just to show you this build out um, uh, in, in, in its uh, impacts. Um, essentially in the last 30 years, 27,000 acres were developed. To build out, there's about 26,000 left to go. This region could absorb another 26,000 acres, which means you could have 12,000 acres of future farmland loss and 13,000 acres of forest loss as zoning is guiding the development right now. That's with no future open space preservation, right? This is not in any timing. I'm not saying five years, I'm not saying 100 years. I'm saying if we build everything out to zoning, these are gonna be the impacts, including an increase of 10,000 acres of impervious surface. So I think that gives you a sense of what, how the study worked. Um, and you know, this is breaking down by each, each watershed. Um, and and uh, so, you know, I just want to give a chance here because of timing to uh, to um, to open it up for for exploring the mapping itself. And so let me um, let me uh, let me back out or, or, or exit out of the out of the um, out of the PowerPoint here. OK. Okay, excellent. So, um, so I, I see that there's some questions coming in here. I'm trying to um, keep an eye on this here and also on the timing. Um, uh, I see a question about it being done statewide. No, this was just done for the Highlands cluster. Uh, it's it was you know it took a lot <laughs> a lot of um, uh, of development to make this happen. Um, uh, Okay, so the question about which which land um, do you know is going to be used for housing versus commercial industrial? We actually created zoning maps, um, and that was a big part of data development was creating a zoning map for this region. We had to collect it from different sources and from municipalities, and we broke it down into a kind of a composite zoning map for the area. So you need to do that. Um, let me let me uh, show a few um, uh, since we're we're, we're our, we're really running. Um, let me show you how this works here. I'm going to share my screen again with. Um, OK, hello. OK, so we're still here. Let me um, share my screen. Okay, there we go. So what we're looking at here now is the um, Highlands cluster study that I just went through. Um, New Jersey map, let me show you how, let me give you some basics here. Um, New Jersey map is, um, is uh, um, easy enough to get to njmap2.com. Okay, and when you get to the homepage here, you can go right to maps. And if we go to maps, you can go to conservation blueprint, or which 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 I just want to go to right now. Conservation blueprint is the um, uh, this is the mapping component for for what I, what I went through with Eric's slides, uh, and you can see and any of the New Jersey map 
layers. So if you click on view a map here, these are all the different projects in New Jersey map. Conservation Blueprint is our most significant project. Conservation Blueprint has multiple models that it shows. So for example, you have um, a model for agriculture and I'll quickly show that because that is one that's easy to give you a sense of how this agriculture works, how this agricultural um, model works. Uh, and so what this is showing is um, different colors. I'm gonna put on the new one because we have a new one here. Uh, and the colors are representing areas that, and, and how, what their potential would be to be uh, added to farmland preservation. So there's a model that creates the, the, the output of either high priority, medium priority, or, or low priority. I'll quickly show that model. We take existing farmland preservation, we map that. We take preserved farmland that's already preserved. Um, we take farmland soils and we break that down into prime, statewide, and unique. We give that three points, two points, and one point respectively. We have agricultural lands. Uh, that gets three points. We have parcels that are near already preserved parcels, parcels that are within a half mile of preserved parcels, and parcels that are in between in our farm belts. All those things give an additional point to the model. And then finally, an agricultural threshold layer, which is, is it already being farmed? Is it larger than five acres? Um, and, and basically, um, is it uh, uh, accessible to being taxed for farmland? All those things add up to, to, to 10 possible points. And if we, if we look at it, we, the models are that accumulation of those uh, 10 possible points. So what I want to quickly show you is to, um, to provide the, um, the parcel-based overlay, right? So you can turn on parcels and you can get any particular parcel you can click on, you can get a sense of what the um, values are for the different um, models. So ecological, water, community, green space, a similar type of model where we've put layers in to identify the uh, conservation um, priorities uh, for those particular themes. And when you click on any one particular parcel, you can open up Parcel Explorer. Parcel Explorer has all New Jersey parcels mapped uh, with information such as Mod 4, uh, and the you know uh, mod four information, but also other things such as what planning zone is it in, what um, whether there's sewer there, whether it's already preserved, and a new layer that we just put in for impervious surface, right? How much of a parcel is covered by impervious surface? So I think that's something that's going to be of, of of unique interest. Anyway, I hope I've given you a little sense of of uh, of this. I see um, that. Um, there are uh, um, so, some more questions that have come in here. Okay, so a few, a few comments. Um, let me uh, show you how you would get to, um, to, to the build out model for the Highlands cluster. If you're in any one of the NJ map layers, in this case, I'm in Fineland Preservation, and I want to change to Highlands build out, I would come to the map, I would come down to build out analysis and do Highlands cluster, and it will bring you in the same location to that same area but in a different New Jersey map theme. So this is the Highlands cluster area. And what you see here is, you can open up the different um, reference layers, but we have our build out simulation. There's a land use in what it could build out. And you might be familiar with the, um, the White Township um, uh, and, um, warehouses that are, are pot potentially proposed in Warren County, you can see that area here as future build out, right? So those warehouses are being built in areas that are zoned for warehouses. And so you can see the build out model capturing them. But you can also see areas where you have a lot of rural um, residential that it could still be built. And you can overlay things like New Jersey hydrography. You can change backgrounds. For example, um, if I turn off the land use uh, map here, um, and the shaded relief, you're gonna see the, the aerial imagery there. So you can get a sense of where this build out is um, going to happen, what it looks like. And here's the final thing that I want to, um, to make, um, make available to you. If you open up boundary layers and you zoom in and you say, okay, any particular land use, if I turn on parcels, 
and I find a parcel that I want to see how much will be built out. You can see the build out model here. Let's pick this parcel, for example. If you click on this parcel, it's going to give you information. Now, parcel has to be turned on for this function to work. Once you turn on parcels and you click on a parcel, you're going to get this modeling that tells you the, the minimum lot size by the zoning, how many acres are buildable, how many acres are constrained on that model, how much is and when you build it out, like we're showing here, how much agricultural land, how much forest land, how much impervious surface um, could be built on that particular model. OK, so um, uh, I think I've run out of time. <laughs> I got 10.08 on my clock here. Um, let me see if there's any particular comments that are that are coming in that um, that I can uh, that I can address. Um, well, OK, so I see Ryan is saying, what are some of the opportunities? for individuals to get involved with the New Jersey Conservation Blueprint? And is there an opportunity to bring this analysis to, to my county in Raritan, in the Raritan watershed? A lot, the, the, the build out analysis is just done for the Highlands cluster, but the blueprint is done statewide, okay? So blueprint and most of the New Jersey map layers here are done statewide. So for example, we have stormwater management tool that we're doing for New Jersey future. That is a statewide project that shows impervious surface. Uh, it shows flood prone areas. It shows combined sewer outfalls. Um, and so many of this stuff is available for, for, um, for, for statewide for different municipalities. And yes, stay tuned. You can send me. And in fact, I would love for anyone on this session to, uh, to provide um, their contact information. Um, and you can email me at hassie at rowan.edu. If you're interested in getting involved in a blueprint, um, we would love to uh, continue to increase the, the user base. So if, I guess I can somewhere put in here my, my email, hassie at rowan.edu. You can also go right to the, um, the information button and um, you can, um, you can add uh, any comments or, uh, or any information there. We, should, we have actually a video coming up, but there are there are areas where you can um, add your comments or, or, or get your name uh, added to our list. OK, so it looks like I'm, I'm out of time here. Um, and, um, I, you know, uh, I appreciate that you are uh, <laughs> bearing through my uh, my technical challenges and getting started here. And I hope that you found this uh, um, worthwhile and I hope to. Uh, see you um, in future Blueprint activities uh, if you're interested. So thank you um, again, and I uh, look forward to the rest of the conference and perhaps uh, uh, meeting and chatting with some of you um, uh, in the, in, during the rest of the day. Okay, thank you so much.